It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome to the show. We are delighted that you're joining us. We are broadcasting live from the Capital One Bank Studios here in New York. And you are listening wherever you're listening. Hey, you know, if you ever miss part of a show, Mark has you hooked up. He'll either, I guess he's on, it's on YouTube, right, Mark? That's, is that the easiest place to get it? Yeah, you can go to YouTube and search Jill on Money or Jill Slash and Jill on Money on YouTube. I got my own YouTube channel. Mark does all these things behind my back. God only knows what he's really doing. He's been sick as a dog. Send your good um, vibes to, to Mark. He needs some health coming into this spring season. He needs some good health. He had a rough, rough winter. If you have a financial question, we would really like to hear from you. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. Askjill at jillonmoney.com. Are you doing your taxes? Are you done yet? Are you happening? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? Got to get it done. I was surprised, you know, earlier um, in the in the month, we had the IRS come out with a big report on how much tax identity fraud is going through the roof, basically. Um, And this is incredible. Listen to this stat. Phishing email scams jumped 60 percent from 2017 to 2018. Good Lord. So, you know, these emails, they kind of look like they're from organizations that you know or have close connection to, but it's off by a little bit. The IRS does not initiate contact with you by email to request personal or financial information. So if you get something that looks like a suspicious email, don't reply, don't click on any attachments, don't click on any links. You want to forward it to the IRS and, of course, delete the original. And... uh If you get a phone scam, which is another one, just if there's someone like aggressive on the phone, just remember that the IRS says that these fraudsters are targeting landline and cell phones. Unbelievable. And then the caller pretends to be from the IRS and threatens you. You owe back taxes, going to call the police, we're going to have jail time, and you got to pay up. And so the fraudsters are basically preying on our fear, right? And look, a lot of people are giving in because they, oh, pay, I'll pay a bogus fee, a prepaid card, wiring money, a gift card, all these things. Oh, my God. These fraudsters, if they could just be a little more productive, we could use them in society. All right. So uh, let's start the program with a call since I started with a, a, a whine about how bad people are. It is Lisa who's calling from New York. Hi, Lisa. Welcome to Jill on Money. What can I do for you? Hi, Jill. Thanks Hi. for taking my call. Sure. Um, I have a question about asset allocation. Um, my husband and I are both 45. We both max out our 401ks. Mine is actually a, the thrift savings program because I'm a federal employee. We're planning on probably retiring as soon as um, I hit my minimum retirement age, which is 57. What are you going to do with and yourself? Wait a second. Who cares? Oh, my God. You are so funny. All right. Okay. So 57. I got 12 years to get you where you want to go. Will you get a pension at 57? I will. And it will probably be around 55000 a year. Pretty good. All right. So it's not a huge amount, but it's, it's something. Hey, that'll right? pay some bills, right? Yeah. You know it exactly. Uh, and we're kind of setting ourselves up so that, you know, we'll have a lot less expenses um at that point you're gonna kick your kids off the uh, payroll or something oh yeah you know it (laughs) will your husband also retire at age 57 or will you force him to continue to work so you have something you know more money coming in i uh no he actually wants to retire at 50 so i'm i'm just pushing him to 57 oh my god you're too funny out at home well, I have to go to work for seven years. Yeah, so I think we're both decided that we want to, to quit at 50. When you're 57 and get that pension, will you have health care as well covered? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, what do you, first of all, what do you make now and what do you spend now? 
Uh, combined income is around 250 Okay. And as far as uh, what we spend, I would say about 10000 a month in expenses. Okay. All in? Like that's for real? Like that's a real number, vacations and all that kind of fun stuff? That is a real number. Okay. Yeah. When you get your pension, because you're a federal employee, does that mean you will not be getting Social Security? No, I'm under the new system, so I will get Social Security. Okay. So, but we still are going to have a five-year gap between when you could potentially actually get Social Security. Not that I think you necessarily should. I'm just saying that's, we got a five-year gap, 57 to 62. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. How much money do you guys have saved? So in our 401ks, um, my husband has about 850000 and I have about 650000 Okay, great. Fantastic. What about non-retirement accounts? Um, Non-retirement accounts, we have about 50000 in brokerage accounts, mm -hmm. and then we have about 40000 in, like, an emergency fund. Okay, so 40000 emergency. Tell me about the um, the house and mortgage and that kind of stuff. Sure. So um, we have about another year left on our mortgage. Um, there's about 42000 left on the mortgage mm. and the house is worth about four hundred thousand are you going to stick around in that house i think so okay we, we yeah i think we probably will kids are how we old downsize. the kids are 10 and 7. Mm. So we have a little while before we take them off our payroll but... yeah i mean like you can't just say all right you're in middle school you're out it's not it's a, that does not go well i think i don't know doesn't sound like a good I'll thing. I'll try it. And then yeah. I'll, I'll tell you how Let me know how that goes. You have an actual case. <laughs> are you guys both maxing out your retirement plan contributions? Yes, we are. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and you're not even 50, so you're at that, you'll, this year it'll be 19000 each, right? Yeah. Okay. What about, like, in the money that's in that brokerage account, uh, are you adding to that on an ongoing basis, or is that earmarked for something? Is that like a kid's fund, or what? what's going on? Um, yes. So we, it's kind of earmarked for college for the kids. Mm -hmm. We just wanted a little bit more flexibility. So we didn't put them in 529, mm -hmm. uh, didn't put the money in 529. Um, yes. Yeah, so we are adding to it, uh, monthly about, um, uh, my husband puts in a thousand in one of the accounts and then in the other account I put in, um, 500 a month. Okay. So 1500 a month into those accounts, which is great. All right, this is what we're going to do, Lisa. We are going to do some fun asset allocation planning with you. And also, I neglected to find out who's managing all of this, whether you're doing this or you're working with an advisor, broker, or whatever. Um, but obviously, since most of the money is in retirement plans, a million and a half bucks already, that's really where the bulk of the assets are. Let's play Can Lisa Retire at 57? That's what we're going to play when we come back. You are listening to Jill on Money. If you, like Lisa, want to know whether your allocation is set up correctly to reach your target retirement goal, let us know. We can help you out. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger takes the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money. Before we went to the break, we were talking to Lisa, who is asking about retirement. Now, Lisa is very focused. I love it. She and her husband in their mid-40s, they want to retire in 12 years, late 50s. The good news for Lisa is that, you know, that pension going to help out a lot. You know, most people who are looking at retirement early, there's two big hurdles. One is, do, have I just set, actually saved enough money to generate the amount of money I need in retirement, but also the health care. So Lisa, very fortunate. You have both pension and health care. And you said that um, before, you know, we went to the break, you said that you would like to retire and that right now, 
you are living on about $10,000 a month. Now, ideally, we wouldn't have you downsize or do anything. We just want you to live on that $10,000 a month, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, we don't. Why, why mess around here? Okay, so I did some quick calculations while we were while we were in the break. And um, have you played with any retirement calculators yourself? I have. Okay, and and did you find that like your lump sum of money that you have, the million and a half in the retirement accounts? I'm not even considering the brokerage account because I presume that that money is going to essentially be used when the kids go to college, but. Just on the retirement plan assets, if you've got a million and a half now, that's going to turn into three plus in 12 years. Plus, you're going to add a half a million dollars just in general over the course of those 12 years. So that kind of gives you a nice big pile of money on which to draw that, you know, some amount every year. And especially in those years where you are going to absolutely need to kind of leave this money alone you're going to have to also have some money in the brokerage account to pay for that interim period between 57 and 62. okay now that said i think you're going to have enough money for retirement but it is going to take some planning so the reason you called was about your asset allocation tell me about what's going on in your asset allocation now how are you how are you looking at this going forward my asset allocation is all equity Oh my God! You are up. You are rolling those dice, lady. I am, but I tend to be a little bit more aggressive because I am getting a pension. Okay, but we got it. But okay, yes. But may, did you freak out when you had all your money in stocks and it was ten years ago when the financial crisis hit, or were you okay? Well, I didn't really have any money at that point. <laughs> right? I mean, it, was... it wasn't enough to worry about. Right. Also, you were now. I feel like there's enough to worry about. Yes. Which is why I'm asking the question. I I think I would dial back that um, allocation. And, and you know why? I think that just given what you've told me, and given your your total income, that you guys are in a very good situation. And I I wonder whether taking on that risk is really doing anything for you. I mean, maybe you would end up with more money at age 57. But what if you had less? And I think that. From my perspective, no matter how risk um, embracing you might be, bad things can happen. So I would add a boring fixed investment to this. You said you were part of the government pension plan. So this is all in the C fund. Is that where you are? I'm actually in the C fund, the I fund, and the S fund. Okay. And so, okay. And is the, is there a, isn't there a fixed account in the government plan? The G fund and the yeah, the um, G fund. How much do you happen to know offhand what the interest rate currently is on the G fund? I don't. I might look into that. I would All right. I so for your stuff, I would look at absolutely having at least like 30% in a safe part in the G fund in you know the bond fund in the fixed fund, okay? And I would start that I would do that right now. But as you got closer, like honestly, even if you kept 70-30 for for the next eight years then I would start to maybe I might even keep it I might go 60 40 but I don't really want you to tap this fund until you have to maybe after you see what your position is in your early 60s so I would sort of be 70 30 right now in the brokerage account I would take much less risk because first of all that money I think you're gonna have some of that money is going to be the kids college some of that money I need you to be accumulating real money so maybe actually when your mortgage is done after next year I would use that amount and add it to your brokerage account whatever that payment was because I need you guys to be focused on what happens in you know different stages of your retirement so you have 57 to 62 which is where you're gonna have to lean heavily on that brokerage account right and then at 62 we should look and see what the you know what your Social Security uh, estimate would be um, obviously it would be better if you didn't have to claim Social Security at 62 and claim it at your full retirement age it really depends on how much money you've saved in the brokerage account and I don't know whether you're gonna really need ten thousand dollars a month when you retire but you know theoretically you have about half of that right now with the money that comes in from the pension another mm-hmm. big chunk of that will come from Social Security but I, I would if we have a big fat brokerage account that's ready to tap into from age 57 to 62 63 64 65 like that would be great 
Alternatively, what you might choose to do when you retire at 57, look at 57 to 62 as a period of time where you guys can like relax, but also make some money doing something. And that Mm -hmm. might help you build up that brokerage account even more and essentially help you go to your full retirement age with the Social Security payment, just because it's such a raw deal when you have to take it at 62. You know, you get that permanent reduction in your benefits in, it's like about a quarter of what you would have actually realized. So if possible, that's what I would do. I would shift the allocation. You're taking on a little bit too much risk and use that brokerage account first for the college is fine. I mean, I, I still love the 529 plan, but be that as it may, you can use the brokerage account and then use that brokerage account to be accumulating that 57 to 62 fund of the the bridge financing. Basically, you're like creating your own little pot of money to get you through that five-year period. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. You feel okay with this or you feel like, oh, she's playing with all my my big upside and why is she doing that to me and what a bad lady? Uh, no, no. You're... I would never feel that way. <laughs> um, I appreciate... Um, your experience and your insight because I, exactly what you said, how did I feel when there was the big, you know, 2008 bust? And my, I would imagine that my feelings would be a lot different um, if we had $600,000 in our retirement and we lost half of it. Yeah. I mean, I think the big, I think that that's like the critical issue, which is as you get older, it's not as I mean, look, you, you still won't need the money for a long time, but your feelings about those gyrations is going, those feelings will change. So it is it is sort of one part, the raw dollar amount, which is so much bigger now. But the other part is that, you know, it's different to go through a huge loss in your portfolio when you're 50 or 55 than when you're 35. And you right. will see that many of the people who really panicked at the financial crisis height were the people who were closest to needing the money. They said, oh God, what what have I done? They blew out of everything because they said, I don't have any time to make this back. I don't know what's gonna happen. So that's why I think it makes sense for you guys. And I, I, I look, I applaud you. You've done an amazing job of saving. You're making a good living. You're gonna have the ability to fund this. But I just wanna say, I'm going on the record as saying this, play this for your husband. I don't think that you guys are, when you're 57 and you're ready to hang them up and your kids are, you know, sort of mostly done and out of the house, I have a feeling you're going to want to do something else. And I don't know what that something else is. Maybe it's going to be no, not something that generates zero income, but you got a long retirement. You could literally live for four decades. So remember, when you retire early, the risk is you spend too much early in your retirement. And one way to avoid spending some of that money is to work a little bit. And you'd be so young, 57, so young. Anyway, good luck, Lisa. Thank you so much for calling. And if you, like Lisa, want to retire early, I would also put that in front of you as just a real important beacon of light. Losses that you incur as you get older and the odds that you're, something bad happens really start to freak you out, they increase. And, you know, just because you could absorb losses in your 30s doesn't mean you'll necessarily feel the same way in your 50s. Okay, you're listening to Jill on Money. When we return, we're going to get to more of your questions because that's what we do here. Our email address, askjill at jillonmoney.com, and our website is jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back with Jill on Money. Ah, Spring. Spring! That's where we are. Somewhere in spring. Probably like, depending on where you live, you could be sort of saying, oh, I want summer to come already. We had very light snowfall here in New York for the winter, so I'm not... Mark doesn't like that. He likes a good snowstorm. Remember when we had... um, We ought to get that... um, What's his name? The guy, the the pollster guy, the stats guy. What's his name again? You know, the guy who used to be at 538, came on early in the show. Oh, yeah, Harry Enten. I loved him. The guy loves weather. 
He loves statistics about weather, sports, and politics. I think he's at CNN now. Let's try to get him. We'll do some fun stuff with him. Uh, okay, this is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. I am Jill Schlesinger. I'm talking to Mark Talercio, the executive producer of the program. We have so many fun things on our website. Go check out jillonmoney.com. And there, you can do all sorts of things. You can, things. You can sign up for our free weekly newsletter. We got a bunch of people now on that list, right, Mark? Like this many? I'm holding up the, the sign. I think that's about it. So that's good. Tens of thousands of people have joined our free newsletter subscription service, which is kind of fantastic. You can all, so it's free, comes out on Friday. Mark kind of curates everything that we do during the week, and then we throw in stuff that we run across that we think is helpful for you as well. So sign up for the free weekly newsletter at jillonmoney.com. And while you're there, why don't you buy the book? You schnores. Come on. I'm just kidding. I would love if you did buy the book, The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money. Uh, you can do it right at the website, jillonmoney.com. Click on the link. Okay. Most importantly, though, we'd love to hear from you. And if you want to get in touch with us, send an email. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. That is what Jeff did. He says that he is approaching the end of a three-year vehicle lease. And... The residual value to buy it will be about $24,000. Now, here's the issue. He doesn't want to take on a new lease, and he does not want to have a car loan. So, complicating problems. He was planning to use some money that he had in savings to purchase the vehicle outright off the lease. However, he had to use that money to make some emergency home repairs. Okay, now to the question. I've had a Roth IRA since about 2001. I'm under 59 and a half, but I know I can withdraw my contributions, which you put into the Roth, without penalty. I was going to do this in order to purchase the vehicle, then replenish my emergency fund with the money that would normally go towards the monthly lease or car payment. I hate the idea of doing this. I've never touched a cent of these funds since I started the Roth but the home repairs could not be avoided. What do you think of this idea? Do you have any alternative ideas? Um, okay, so a couple of things come to mind. One is that I too don't like the idea of you pulling the money out of the Roth. And I don't know, maybe you're sort of playing a little bit of mental um, mathematical gymnastics because I know you don't want to take on a new lease or a car loan. On the other hand, depleting the emergency reserve fund means that I really need you to do two things. That is, replenish the emergency reserve fund and pay for the new car. So I wonder if we could talk a little bit about other ideas. You have a Roth IRA. Do you have a retirement plan through work is there a loan that you could take out maybe that's a possibility could you potentially look at what it would be what what your situation would be if you were were to take that car loan what's the percentage interest rate you might pay um could you even consider what's going on in the house and say is this a time to potentially refinance the house You know, the Federal Reserve has said they're basically not raising rates this year, and that means that interest rates have dropped down, at least on the short term, uh, you know, and and even the medium term tenure is down. Uh, Is there some possibility of refinancing? And maybe that would help you in this process. I don't know. I feel like I want to know more about you, Jeff. So if you wouldn't mind, if you could provide us with a little bit more information, I think we might be able to help you out. Okay? Um, Okay. Mary is looking for certified financial planners. um, And uh, so here's the thing. Um, Two big places that you might find the resource. One is that you try the CFP board website, letsmakeaplan.org. That will give you CFPs. You just pop in your your, uh, zip code. Um, That'll give CFPs in your area. You could also try something which would give you a fee 
only planner, meaning someone who cannot charge commissions. These folks are members of an organization called NAPFA, N-A-P-F-A, NAPFA.org. And there you can also try to find some advisors who are fiduciaries, meaning they got to put your best interest first. And you can find those in your neighborhood. So give those two a try and let us know how it goes. That would that, that that's the best advice. Um, okay. Um, mm-hmm. Time. Okay. Uh, so here's someone who's writing in. Laurel has got a couple of kids and been contributing to 529 plans, but very unhappy about 2018 portfolio results for the 529. And the problem probably is that in your 529, you're maybe taking on too much risk. So in that plan, what you ought to do is see if you can choose some less risky versions of that, especially for the kid who's the sophomore in high school, sixth grader, fine. But the sophomore in high school, I might kind of scale back a little bit. And if you really don't like the ups and downs, you may want to move to a structure that's you know, more heavily tilted towards a fixed investment. Maybe it's bonds, maybe it's cash, but I think that that's going to probably help you out. Be careful with these um, 529 plans, not unlike the problem that we see with target date funds. Some of these are more um, tilted towards risky investments than you realize. So just be careful, okay? (sighs) All right. You are listening to Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Give us a holler. It's askjill at jillonmoney.com. And uh, check out our sister podcast. You can subscribe to it on Apple, Stitcher, Radio.com, Google Play, anywhere else you find your favorite podcast. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger takes the mystery out of your finances. You're back with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question or a comment about maybe an appearance on the radio or maybe it's something else going on that you think I got right or wrong, shoot us a note. Very easy to do. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Okay, so I wrote an article in the Chicago Tribune, but it's actually my Tribune article, so it's syndicated all over the place. You may have seen it. Um, And it basically was talking about why not all workers are feeling these wage increases that are being reported every month by the Labor Department. So um, here is a guy named Mike who has a lot of designations. Woof, go for good gosh. Um, and he said, I wanted, I simply wanted to reach out to extend my compliments to you on your article in Monday's Chicago Tribune business section. We work exclusively with employer-sponsored retirement plans, primarily small and medium-sized businesses in the private sector. And our experiences every day validate the message you delivered in your article. With the majority of the 401k plan participants we deal with falling into the category of non-highly compensated, we consistently field questions from that population that focus more on the logistics associated with initiating loans against 401k balances than questions related to saving and investment strategies. In spite of being in the midst of what many believe to be a strong economy, wage growth and financial literacy continue to be a growing struggle across the working population in the United States. It should continue to be a cause for great concern amongst our legislative leaders in Congress. Thank you for your extraordinary reporting and best wishes for continued success. Well, thank you, Mike. That's awfully nice of you, or Michael. Um, And I will just note that we are about to come into April, which is Financial Literacy Month. And uh, I, I would love to know from your perspective, what are the, the parts of your financial life that you don't quite understand? What is it that we need to do a better job of describing? What is it? Okay. So there is, I think that essentially 
there there is just a ton of information that's out there, but people are still mystified by their financial lives. But tell us what's on your mind. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Uh, Mary has a son who struggles socially. He's had a tough time with jobs. He's intelligent. He graduated from a culinary program. Um, he makes 12 and a half bucks an hour, works 30 hours a week, gets no benefits. Of course, his medication is costing him about $240 a month. He buys medical insurance uh, through the healthcare.gov website. Where does someone like this fit into the work equation? Surely he can't support himself on his income. I wish employers could be more understanding with people with this type of disability, the invi- the invisible type. Oh, I know. That's so hard. Um, I, I knew somebody who was in a very similar situation and uh, found that actually some of the tech companies were a bit more understanding. So I think that that's interesting to maybe go to some of the places where being social is not necessarily the value that they're putting on you. Anyway, um, okay. Uh, Here's a question from Rick who um, never read the short bio. um, And then he says, I'm in the IT industry and I read that you were a certified financial planner and former options trader, which of course makes sense for the columns you write. I saw you were a CIO of an investment advisory firm and for a half a second I thought, what an interesting background for a chief information officer. And I immediately slapped my head. It wasn't that kind of CIO, duh. <laughs> chief investment officer, yeah, not chief information officer. But um, anyway, you should know that some of your readers enjoy your columns, but we are also morons. Rick, you're not a moron. Every time I see CIO, I think it's chief investment officer. And often, more often than not, in this day and age, it is chief information officer. So I do the same thing, but in reverse. Uh, Dwight has about 34 grand in a Vanguard 500 index for his daughter's college. He doesn't need to draw on the fund until, say, July, August of 2020. Should I leave it until closer to that time? Should I withdraw withdraw it sooner given recent volatility? Mark, are you ready to sell the whole thing? I am. Dwight, sell that sucker. Sell it. Because I don't know how much more you could make, but I do know that if it drops precipitously at this point, you are not going to be a happy camper. So please, 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 absolutely, do sell it. Make it. Make that happen. All right? Uh, Mark, what do I got? One more question? Here we go. Um, Edward is getting ready to retire in a year or so, his wife in a couple of years. The advisors take it is our advisors is suggesting taking some of our 401k, 403b and put it in a fixed annuity to guaranteed income and protect some of our 401k from an up and down market. Is this a good idea? Uh, I doubt it. But there is a case for a fixed annuity. I just have to really, someone's going to have to tell me this is a great idea for you. Um, isn't there a way for you guys to look at your retirement planning and do it without an annuity? Ask this advisor one question. Are you a fiduciary? Do you have to put my needs first? Then ask him or her uh, to say, what if? what is the total cost of doing that? What is the cost of the annuity that you would sell me? What is your pay if I buy this annuity from you? What are the cheaper alternatives? Those are some of the questions to ask. Thank you for writing. Appreciate it. You're listening to Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, maybe it's retirement, maybe it's investment, uh, maybe it's just a comment, ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Hop onto our website, JillOnMoney.com. You can read, listen, watch, sign up for our free weekly newsletter, and you can order my book, The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money. We'll be right back. You're back with Jill on Money. We are broadcasting live from the Capital One Bank Studios in New York City. And we would love to hear from you. Just give us a holler. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. And that is what a anonymous mom wrote. (laughs) She wrote in to us. She's a 28-year-old single son. And he was asking her the other day, hey, what should I do with extra cash? that I have. Um, He's got a home, so that's good. Um, 
It's a fixer-upper. He's got no debt. He's got health insurance with an HSA attached to it, no other insurance. His, her advice was, hey, build up your HSA account to your deductible. Put money away for a couple of months for a rainy day fund. I think that's great advice. Um, so, you know, he's co-owner in a business with his father, and they started it six years ago or so. She says the business is doing well. Uh, he he pays himself once a month to cover his expenses, a little extra so he can make sure he's got enough to pay his employees each week. He's talking about a Roth 401k. You know what? Instead of doing that, here's what I think he should do. Number one is I like the idea of putting money into the HSA. I like the idea of building up his rainy day fund. Why doesn't he just put a, open a Roth IRA? A Roth IRA would be perfect for him, uh, $5,500. Um, one other thing to mention, he had a grandmother who passed away. Um, and so mom has ten grand in an account for him that he doesn't know about. And I was holding off on giving it to him until I saw some maturity. I think by running his business, he's gained that to some point. What should I do about that? So what I think you should do is you should say, hey, here's good news. Here's ten grand. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put um, – I'm going to make a Roth IRA contribution for you um, or at least let's do half. Let's say that you put in uh, 2500 and he puts in 3000 do that, and then the rest of it will be his rainy day fund, and then he's all set. But it is time to move that money into his name. I think a Roth IRA is a perfect way to think about it. Um, all right, uh, Walter wants to know whether he should be taking withdrawals in retirement at the beginning of the year or on a monthly basis. Uh, just do what's easiest for you. Don't don't. I mean, it, don't want to time the market. Whatever you think is going to be the easiest way to manage your cash flow. Market goes up or down. I wouldn't worry. Do it the way you feel like is most comfortable. All right. It's Jill on money. And when we return for the second hour, we're going to get into more of your questions. They are fantastic. Just remember, you can always email us. Ask Jill at Jill We'll be right back. It's the weekend, and that can only mean one thing. You're listening to Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome back. It's hour number two of the Jill on Money show, where we are broadcasting live from the Policy Genius Studios. Policy Genius is the easy way to compare and buy insurance. You know, I just went on the website, Mark, just to check it out. They're adding a bunch of stuff. So there's life, there's disability, there's renters, there's even pet insurance, which is very near and dear to my heart. Auto, homeowners, health. And when you click more, what do you get? Other stuff, jewelry, identity theft insurance, which I'm not sure I would ever do. Traveler's insurance, never do. Well, I shouldn't say that. The only time I do traveler's insurance is when I'm going on a like an expensive trip and I'm just worried that some relative's going to get sick. That's where I am in my life, ladies and gentlemen. Because, you know, oh, it's so hard. Got to have these conversations, ladies and gentlemen, with your aging parents. These are not fun. Mark, I could imagine that would be a fun conversation for you. <clears throat> yeah, not for Mark. Okay, if you've got a financial question, give us a holler. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Here is a listener um, known as G in the Bay Area who listens to us on KSFO on Sundays. And I have coffee with you every time, G, because he says he gets his morning coffee. Or she. Don't know. Okay. G is a 62-year-old federal employee and wants to work another 10 or 15 years. God, I love that. Okay. So, G says, I just found out that I can also do a Roth IRA and put $6,500 in it. Because... G's over 50, right? So when you're over 50, 5,500 if you're under the age of 50, an extra 1,000 if you're over the age of 50. Okay. Should I get a mutual fund or an exchange-traded fund? Eh, mutual fund. I think mutual fund is fine. Get an index fund. And uh, if you wanted to say, you know, basically, I'm debating, he, uh, G says Vanguard or TD Ameritrade. 
uh, they're probably both going to be cheap. I mean, Vanguard mutual funds buying directly or TD is, I think, is fine. There, either one is fine, and so you would basically want for long term money, right, ten or fifteen years, a stock fund, a bond fund. What should we give? And then maybe let's do an international stock fund. And if you really wanted to be um, sort of like a general allocation for someone who's in that, you know, 62 years old, 10, 15 years, not going so crazy, you might sort of say, okay, I want to be 50, 50, 50 stock, 50 bond. Well, maybe you even want to be 60, 40. And if I were 60, 40 and I was throwing some money in here, in addition to your federal plan, because you have, I'm sure you're using the federal tax sheltered annuity, the TSA. And um, in, in, if that's the case, then I might just say like a 40% in a broad index fund, maybe 10% in an international index fund, and 50% in an intermediate term bond fund. That's it. So real easy, um, nothing really, I, I don't know. It, this shouldn't complicate matters too much. Um, but that's kind of how I feel. The, the last question that G asks, which many of you ask, do I take clients? No. You know why I'm in such a good mood? Because I don't have clients. I love you guys, but it's a killer business to be in. So I used to be in a uh, a business where I would, you know, take on clients. Not anymore. So all I'm here to do is not to get clients, is to help you guys out. That's what I do. So no clients anymore. I haven't done that for like 11 years or something. Mark, do you know what it is? You ready for this? It's coming up on my 10th anniversary at CBS. That's kind of when I met you, right? Early on, 10 years ago. Mark used to work over at CBS Radio. Mark walked into the CBS Broadcast Center for 14 years. You were already a whipper, young but um, aggressive and confident whippersnapper when I met you. All right. Here we go. More questions from Donald is taking Social Security and he and his wife have teacher pensions. He's 63. She's 56. Question. If something happens to me, can my wife get any part of my Social Security benefit now or later when she turns 60? I think it's when you're... I don't know the answer to that, Mark. Do you know the answer to that Social Security question? I thought it was a 60 also, but it may be that there's a widow's benefit. I'm not sure. I'll have to look that up for you guys. Um and Don then says, should I up my current $100,000 life insurance policy up to $500,000? Well, I don't know. Does she need it? She's going to have a pension and her own Social Security. Why do you need more? Is she going to need life insurance? And I want to know what kind of life insurance that is. I'm not even sure you need what you have. Send me more details. I'm interested. Okay. Arlen wants to know, can somebody have too much money in tax-advantaged accounts okay here's the question really uh arlen's helping she says i'm helping my daughter and she's 24 years old 18 months out of college no debt she purchased a used car she paid cash she's got 12 grand in a roth ira she's making 60 grand a year good for her all right Okay, so she says my advice to my daughter put 10 percent of your salary into a roth 401k the employer gives you 6% without, it's no match, just a, uh, an end. So put 10% in your salary and to f maximize her HSA, only using it for major medical expenses. She's got about four months of expenses in a bank savings account. Two, one question. Here we go. Is it too much in tax advantage? Should she put some in tax deferred? No, no. This is fantastic. These accounts are fantastic. The Roth money's already been taxed. She's in a low tax bracket, and her earnings are only going to go up. Um, and I don't think if she were going to have extra money to have just available, I'm not sure. It, it kind of she doesn't have plans to purchase a house, but maybe what I would say is this: uh, maybe beef up that emergency reserve fund a little bit, get up to six months in there, and um, and then maybe I would just put more into that Roth 401k. I think that's what I would do. Um, I love this. This kid is on track. You're doing great. Great messaging to her. So fantastic. 
Um, okay. Ah, uh, let's see. Here is uh, Carl, who wants to know. I mentioned something in a recent article about the declining impact of the tax cut, and. Carl's like, hey, you're not the first one to state that. I'm confused. The tax cut is for 2019. It hasn't taken place yet. Wrong. The tax cut was for 2018. That's why people are actually discussing it now. So we've had one year. The tax bill was passed in 2017, went into effect beginning of 2018. So that's the issue about this. So the corporations did bring home some of the overseas dollars not a lot mostly what they did was buy back their shares and increase their dividends so that's the answer thanks for writing in appreciate it carl you are listening to jill on money and when we return mark and i are absolutely ecstatic when we get emails from you we don't always respond immediately but do send us your question ask jill at jillonmoney.com we are blowing through emails we're trying to get through All the ones that are piling up, thank you always for being patient. We'll get back to your questions when we return. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back with Jill on Money. And if you've got a financial question, we'd love to help you out with it. It may be a last-minute tax question. It may be that you're looking forward to your um, very first home that you want to buy. It could be lots of different things. Whatever it is, whatever's on your mind, we want to hear from you. Send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Okay. Uh, Fred is asking a question about um, using a 401k account to better position for 501c3 donations. Okay, let's think about this. Let's get through this. My wife and I file taxes jointly. I am 73. And for 2017, the tax year 2017, my required minimum distribution was $56,000. That included $14,000 withheld for federal taxes, $2,000 withheld for state taxes, which meant that we got a balance of $39,000 that went to our joint bank account. Presently, I am writing checks to charitable organizations, 501c3s, from our joint checking account, approximately $20,000 a year. My financial planner advised me to have Schwab send me checks for my 401k account and to write my checks for 501c3s as I can get some tax benefit. Eh, This is so wrong. We got a little thing. I don't know what your advisor actually said to you. So here's the thing. What is your accountant, uh, sorry, your financial advisor explaining to you? He or she is explaining to you something called a qualified charitable distribution a q c d okay and here's the deal a q c d essentially means that you you can if you're 70 and a half or older which you are and you are subject to required minimum distributions you are you can divert that money instead of going to you it can go straight to the charitable organization okay now let's be clear about a couple of things it cannot come from our 401k so i'm hopeful that you're using 401k as kind of like a a a code uh that that is your old 401k that's in an ira because this is only available to ira owners not 401ks okay so what can happen here let's kind of play the math out let's say that you want to take your required minimum distribution and fifty six thousand and of that fifty six thousand you instruct the custodian of your ira to send that twenty thousand dollars to whichever charitable organizations that you want to gift to now instead of being taxed on that money the money goes straight to the charities so you don't pay tax on that 20000 So you get 56000 distribution. 20 of it goes to the charity. Then you pay tax on the remaining part. 
So in your case, 56 minus the 20, 36,000 is where the tax is wh- where you, what you would pay tax on. What's the advantage of this? You don't pay tax. What's the disadvantage? Well, it may be that you used to be able to claim charitable contributions and maybe you still do if you itemize, but this may be a really fabulous way to give. But you can't get both. You can either say, I'm not taking the money. It goes straight to the charity from my IRA account. Cannot come to you. It goes straight to the charity, direct. And then you're not taxed on that money. Or the money comes to you, you send it to the charity, and then you put it as part of your itemized deductions if you are able to itemize. So that is the the deal with the charitable contributions and I, I really want to remind everybody who's thinking about a qualified charitable distribution, this is an amazing tool. It is, like, fantastic. And it's especially good for those people who used to itemize, right, but now claim the standard deduction. Because if you don't itemize, you can't write off your charitable contributions anyway. So this is a really good thing to consider, Fred. And if you've got more questions, maybe because... I'm missing something. Just shoot us another email, okay? Okay. Sarah, um, let's see. Like in the last couple of years, married, had a daughter, lost her father, got a new job. Uh, has her, her husband has a couple of kids from a previous marriage. There's a lot of stuff. Last year, she says, we did some initial estate planning This year, we want to do some financial planning. We both contribute to retirement accounts and 529s. We have mortgages, student loans, some savings, some investment accounts. Our financial picture is much more complicated and better funded than just a few years ago. But we haven't set any goals. We don't have, we we really haven't perfected our method of combining or sharing finances. So, ready. Here's the three questions. One, is it okay that we're still doing our own taxes with TurboTax? Sure. Why not? You can do it. Let's see if there's some weird wrinkle that comes up, but yeah. Uh, Two, is there a benefit to refinancing our mortgage for a 15-year with a slightly lower rate? Eh, I don't know. I sort of feel like if you're going to pay down your mortgage, you can pay it down later. You've got a lot of obligations right now. Depends what the rate is, but I'd be interested if you have a good low interest rate for your 30-year I wouldn't necessarily go to a shorter term. And the reason for everyone listening is that if your cash flow is going to be constrained by going to a 15-year mortgage, you may not want to do that, especially if you've got a couple kids and a couple stepkids. There's a lot going on in that family. Okay. Uh, Third, should we accept the sales pitch at our credit union to meet with their advisor or find our own CFP? (laughs) Mark, would you like to answer that question? Uh, We're going to choose find your own CFP. Um, Or you can maybe, you know, you've got an online advisor. If they offer advice, you might want to start there because that's a cheaper way to go. So I think that that's fine. Um, Most of the online um, places are giving you CFPs anyway. If you want to find a CFP, the best place to do that is letsmakeaplan.org. So there we go. Got that done. It's fantastic. Okay. Um, Rich is about to retire, wants to know what to do with his nest egg, wants to minimize taxes. He's got a bunch of pre-tax accounts, one and a half million bucks, no immediate needs, would love to pass on some of the money to kids in the future. Um, I'm 57. I've got a healthy pension that meets my financial needs, and my wife is a high-income earner. Boy, Rich, you did it right, man. We have a 15-year mortgage, 2.85% with 10 years to go. I am concerned about future tax rates and that they could go quite high. It looks like my wife's income combined with my pension, that our adjusted gross income will remain high in the future. It's not a bad problem to have. I want to be smart about it. I love your show. I listen when I can. Listen all the time, Rich. Okay. Uh, So here's the thing. If you want... When, I mean, I don't know when you're going to retire, but if you had an old retirement account, maybe you would roll that and start to convert that into a Roth IRA. I don't know how much money you have outside of that, but I think that what you, 
are kind of pointing to is that in the next five years or so, let's consider this. We know that the tax rates are pretty much at the lowest level in the modern era. And so the 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 idea might be for you to convert a portion of those pre-tax accounts into Roth accounts. The only issue is if you don't have the money outside of retirement accounts to pay the tax due, not good. Um, so that's it. And by the way, that's the same for Sue who wants to know about transitioning to a Roth IRA from a traditional. Same thing. If you do that, I mean, you can pay the tax now. If your tax bracket is low today, you may want to convert to a Roth IRA because also those Roth IRAs, they're not subject to required minimum distributions. So for those of you considering it, now's the time. You're listening to Jill on Money. If you have a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Just send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. And if you've missed any part of this show, you can uh, hop on the website, jillonmoney.com. You can also subscribe to our podcast there. So check it out. We've got lots of fun stuff there. Jill on Money, we'll be right back. Four hundred one ks, IRAs, refinancing. She covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back with Jill on Money. You know what's been so much fun is going on other people's podcasts and being interviewed for the book. It's so different. I'm not sure I like it so much, but it is fun to sort of feel weirdly uh, like a fish out of water being the one who's being interviewed versus interviewing. So uh, check out our Twitter feed at Jill on Money if you want to see hear some of those episodes. Uh, and I've been doing some writing for other places, mm-hmm. maybe not just my own, but um, did a, uh, a, set, a, a nice article for a blog post. I guess we're not allowed to call it a column or an article anymore, right, Mark? I should just say everything's a blog post. I wrote words down and disseminated them to The Muse, which is a pretty cool website. We had the founders on the show a while back. Uh, so anyway, check out the Twitter feed at Jill on Money. Don't check it out too long because it's a cesspool on that Twitter. It's nasty. Um, and uh, be careful because uh, there's too much nonsense going on in social media. All right. Uh, if you've got a financial question, the email address, ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Tom wants to know, uh, with more and more states legalizing marijuana, I'm thinking of investing maybe 1000 or $2,000 into one of these pot stocks, do you think it's worth my while? Uh, You know what, Tom? Let's put this in the category of how would you feel if that just totally disappeared? How would you feel if that money, that couple thousand dollars, just went down the toilet? If you don't mind it and you want to take a little flyer, sure, why not? You know? So, anyway, that's what I would suggest. Don't... Or you could just go to your favorite gambling establishment, spend the same thousand or two. That's about how we're looking. It's just a, it's a, it's a flyer, okay? All right. Susan writes. Uh, my husband is a retired teacher, and um, he purchased. So when he retired, he purchased life insurance that would cover two times his teacher's retirement, so that if he were to die, she would get the money for the rest of her life. When I retire and begin collecting my Social Security, if my husband is already deceased and I'm collecting his teacher's retirement, will I have to give up a percentage of my Social Security the way he had to? It's a lot of um, um, assumptions there. So I don't know. Uh, You, I think that you would all, whatever he is subject to in terms of the um, carve out for Social Security, I'm pretty sure you would be as well. But what you can do is you can actually go and contact the retirement office, or it sounds like he's a teacher, so the union, and find out what the rules are. They know. So check it out. All right. Uh, Tim listens to the program all the time, and he says, at first I was intimidated to ask you, but I see you have callers with less money than I have. First of all, don't be intimidated. We're very nice people here. We really are. All right. So Tim says, 
he was self-employed for a number of years. And then he went belly up. Oh, he lost everything. House, car. Um, it took me 15 years to get back on track. And now I have great credit. I bought a home, et cetera. I'm 67. I'm collecting Social Security while I'm still working. My goal is to quit working. I have a renter that pays about 40% of my mortgage. I have another building that if I put about 15 grand into, I could rent that out also. I have enough income to stop working. Wondering if I should do home equity loan or borrow from my 401k. I only have about 20 grand. No borrowing from the 401k. No way. And if you can't get a loan for the against the property, against that property itself, then don't do it. In fact, just wondering, out of curiosity, uh, the the other building, what about selling it and getting some liquidity? What's it worth? I got some more questions for you. You're going to have to follow up with me, Tim. I'm intrigued, but I want you to, but I really, I'd like to hear more from you. Okay. Um, here's from Sam, who is writing in response to an article I wrote about uh why many people are not feeling the bump up in wages. Um, and he says, if the average family income in the U.S. is about 60000 for a family of four with mostly two people. Okay, so the, the bottom line is that he, he's asking, why, do you, why is it that, you know, everyone's describing the economy as good? The economy is good because it's an overall snapshot. But it's like saying, you know, Life expectancy is good, except if you're the schmuck who got diagnosed with terminal cancer. So in every the problem here is that at the if we look at wages over the last 25 years, the middle income rung is still kind of stuck where it was two decades ago. The lower end earners are still um, are making wage gains there. But, you know, it doesn't mean that they're living large. It means they're making gains. And the higher end exploded on the upside. Um, what we're really talking about when we say the economy is good, it's it's kind of, it's it's humming along. It's not terrible. It's not great. And when the Federal Reserve last met in uh, March, in the middle of March, they think the economy is going to grow by about two percent a year. That's just not a lot. And so, a lot of people need to understand that um, when. When you're looking at the data and the statistics, it it doesn't spread out evenly. Uh, So Jack writes about the same article that a lot of the increases in service jobs, it's a lot of the increases at the lower end, not just service jobs, but just minimum wage has gone up overall in many states. So um, he's worried about the, uh, the amount of debt that we're holding. And uh, so... uh, you know, all the I'm not so worried about the debt, but some are. Uh, all right. Here's a note from Dan, who listens to us on Wood Radio. What are you doing, Mark? What's your favorite slogan? Wood Radio, Grand Rapids, Michigan, the best. Um, so Dan's nearing retirement. He needs one go to guy or gal that I can trust with all of my questions. I visited a financial planner, talked about this thing. I'm just not sure he's the right person. Not confident in his responses. What should I be looking for in this person? Abilities, knowledge, a better title. I have many friends who are wealthy and and retired. I could go to them. I think a person that is detached from my life would be better. Um, Okay. Mark, let's follow up and send him the 10 questions to ask. Go to CFP's website, letsmakeaplan.org, or go to the National Association of Personal Financial Advisors, napfa.org. There you can find a great advisor, or at least one that's going to put your interest first. All right, you're listening to Jill on Money. When we return, we're getting through all these emails. Give us a shout at askjill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back with Jill on Money. If you've got a question that is smoldering, why don't you give us a shout? Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. You can also reach us through our website, Jill on Money. Jillonmoney.com. 
And while you're there, catch all that cool content we got. We also have this Contact Us button right there from the website. So let's do it. Sunny writes that I am married with two young kids, ages two and eight. My wife is 32. I'm 36. I'm working full time. I make $68,000 a year with extra for when overtime is offered. My wife is at home, (laughs) definitely has the more difficult job between the two of us. I have a rental property, but my relative lives there and pays the mortgage. I don't get any more than just the mortgage amount. I've been paying extra principal for the past two years, not by much, maybe 30 to 100 bucks a month. Current balance is $80,500. Okay, now on to them. My wife and I have purchased a new home and we'll have a mortgage of $196,000 starting in May. And we'll be paying about $1,300 a month. We'll deplete our savings for the down payment. For the next year or so, would it be better to start building up the savings or pay extra on the rental after the new mortgage payment? The answer is build up those savings. Really, absolutely positively. Because I think that it is always this exciting, tantalizing thing to pay off a mortgage. However, the problem with doing so is that once you pay off that mortgage, that money is gone. So we talked about this in the previous segment this hour where someone asked a follow-up question. Even if you cannot deduct a loss on your personal return, even if the mortgage amount is sort of a small amount, and even if the interest rate is maybe a slightly higher than your primary residence, I still think having an emergency savings is really important. So what I think is he's putting money into his 401k, 7%, but absolutely I believe you should rebuild that uh, mortgage, that uh, emergency reserve fund. Don't pay off the mortgage, okay? Dave writes, uh, he wants to know about early retirement. He's going to be 60 this spring. Wife is 58. They have $3 million in net worth, mostly rental property, which we own outright. My wife would be continue to work. I love her. The big issue is medical until age 65, two grand a month. Oh, wife doesn't have benefits through her employer. That would force me to draw retirement savings to make up the difference. Then I would file at 62 to pay for medical. I wanted to wait until 65 or 66 to file for Social Security retirement benefits. We've got 600 grand in retirement savings. I'd like to either go back to school to learn more about investing or get my real estate license. Working part-time could be an option. I'd like your feedback on going early or wait until 65. Mark, guess what I'm going to say? Wait. Wait. Unless you are so miserable... Why? I don't understand why you would, why would you, you can do those things on the side. You can get your real estate license on the side. You can learn more about investing on the side. You don't have to actually do this. You really don't. You don't have to basically say, oh, I'm going to just leave. uh, Goodbye. I'm done. Come on. You don't have to do that. So no. Kathy writes that she bought an annuity three or four years ago. She retired earlier this year. She started her 401k in 1996. I probably made major mistakes during the downtimes. I needed someone smarter than me watching my money. Have I made the worst mistake of my life? Kathy, I doubt it's the worst mistake. Um, the, the problem, I don't have enough information about your annuity, um, but you have it now. And I wouldn't go crazy. Um, send us what you have in there and and what else you, what else is going on. And then we can try to help you out. Because uh, I don't have enough information to help get this to the right place. OK. Uh, question from Andy. Should I use a 4% guaranteed variable annuity versus a Roth? I don't know what that means. I, I need more information. Guys, send me more information. Probably don't use an annuity if you're if possible. Uh, that said, uh, if you have a great annuity and it's a low cost annuity and there's no commission and that makes sense for you, that could be good. I just don't know. You guys have to um, send me a little bit more. Just a little bit. Not a ton more. A little bit more. Okay. Um, we're trying to plow through your emails where Mark and I have uh, 
just desperate to get through all of last year in January by the end of the first quarter. I think we can get through February by the end of the first quarter. What do you think? We're foregoing some guests. We'll we'll give you some guests later. We have some stuff that's in the can. I just wanted to get these emails and these responses. We want to just get them out to you because some of you don't want to come on the show live with us, which is a shame because I always like, because, you know, in that situation, I could just ask a follow-up and find out more about you. Change your name. Don't worry. No one knows your voice anyway. They barely know my voice, and I'm on the air all the time. Hey, wait, do I recognize that voice? All right, just kidding. A new report that was out by Trulia found that more and more married couples are have been uh, living with roommates. That's a weird thing. That is really weird. Would you rather have a roommate, like a friend of yours, living with you as a married couple, or would you rather move in with your parents? Hmm, I don't know. Neither one sounds too appealing. You're listening to Jill on Money. Uh, When we return more of your questions during the break, go to our website, jillonmoney.com, and buy my book, Darn It, The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money, 13 Ways to Right Your Financial Wrongs. We'll be right back. You're back with Jill on Money. Before we uh, close out the program, let's do a few more emails. Remember, if you do have a question, you can send us an email anytime. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. All right, here is Carissa who wants to know, is it ever a good idea to cash out or borrow from an IRA or 401k to pay off high percentage credit card debt to have some breathing room? I work full time. I have two kids. I'm taking college classes. I'm reimbursed by my employer. So a second job is not feasible at this time. I owe about $7,000 on cards. Okay, cashing out, not a good idea. I think the question about borrowing from a 401k is a possibility. I'd want to know how secure your job is because if you then just bail on this job or they cut you um, in a big downsizing, that money that you borrow from a 401k becomes a taxable taxable distribution if you don't pay it back. Also, I kind of want to know how much money you totally have in terms of like the money in the IRA and the 401k. Alternatively, I would like to present you with another idea, and that is that you could try to consolidate this debt with an installment loan. So the sponsor of my podcast, Jill on Money, is Marcus by Goldman Sachs, and they have a pretty cool program where you can, you know, for the people who qualify, you can borrow money and they create a nice loan schedule to pay it off. And often the rates are uh, lower than what you might get on a credit card. You're subject to all the, you know, important stuff and there's a million caveats, but go check out Marcus.com and see if you can qualify That may be also a good idea, but we want to compare those two. So send me some more information and we can help you out. Okay, that that's easy to do. Uh, Okay, and then finally, this is from Thomas, who is required to take money out of his retirement account. Uh, He's got thirty two hundred dollars, wants to know where he can put that money to be safe and also earn some interest. Um, If you want to risk it, you can put it in an online platform. If you want to be safe, you can put it in some CDs. Go check out depositaccounts.com, depositaccounts.com, and find a safe place with FDIC insurance, et cetera, to get you there. Okay, this has been an awesome show. Thank you so much for listening. Remember, every week we can give you all that you need in terms of your financial life. Send us an email with your questions. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. And remember, this hour... Brought to you by Policy Genius, the easy way to buy and compare insurance. All right, it's Jill on Money. Hop onto the website if you need anything else. JillonMoney.com. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening.